It was supposed to be an easy job for a team of men who repair underwater pipelines. Chris Lemons, 32-year-old deep sea diver, was typically away from home for up to four week periods several times a year. He had a job replacing oil pipes at the bottom of the North Sea, more than 120 miles off Aberdeen in northeast Scotland. As Chris got ready to leave on the 18th of September 2012, he gave his fiancée the usual reassurances, telling her not to worry about him. The last thing he expected that day was to be unconscious and without oxygen, 300 feet below the surface, after the tubes which supplied air, communications, power, and hot water to keep him warm were completely severed. This is the story of Chris Lemon's harrowing ordeal. Chris trained in specialized saturation diving, also known as SAT, a job that involves maintaining seabed pipes for the oil and gas industry. It has its risks, from decompression sickness to drowning, and several SAT divers have died in recent decades. The job paid well, helping the couple plan an exciting future together. They were building a dream house overlooking the sea. Their wedding was set for the following April. It's called saturation diving because at the intense pressures found in the deep sea, gas that a diver breathes saturates the body. When the diver surfaces and the pressure drops, this gas can emerge as deadly bubbles in the blood and tissues, causing decompression sickness or the bends. Sat divers reduce this risk by living full time in a pressurized chamber in the dive ship. For the September job, Chris would be a part of a three-man team sharing the sat chamber with three other teams for a month aboard the 348-foot vessel Topaz. He was pleased to learn that he'd be working with Duncan Orcock. Duncan had been diving in the North Sea for over 17 years. He worked with Chris, who had qualified 18 months earlier on his first few dives, becoming Chris's unofficial mentor. Their third team member would be David Yuasa. The men had to spend four days in the decompression chamber before they could begin work, as the 300 foot depth of the dive required a slow acclimatization. On this job, the divers will live at 10 times the atmospheric pressure, matching that of the seabed. Chris couldn't properly speak to his fiance, because helium in the chamber made the divers' voices high pitched and distorted but they kept in touch via email. <laughs> Just before 9pm, on September the 18th, 2012, it was Chris's team's turn to dive. The three transferred to a diving bell, a smaller vessel for transport to the deep sea. The diving bell was lowered on cables to around 250 feet below the topaz. Chris and David would descend a further 50 feet to replace some pipe on a structure resting on the seabed. The men would be connected to the bell by umbilical cords attached to their diving suits. These two inch thick clusters of tubes carried air, communications lines, power for the lamps and cameras on their helmets, and hot water to keep their suits warm. The seawater was just 39 degrees Fahrenheit. At the core, there was a steel reinforced rope. Each diver had 165 feet of this lifeline coiled and ready inside the bell. Duncan's job was to feed the line to the divers as needed. Above water, the wind was about 35 miles per hour and the seas some 13 feet high. Instead of fixed propellers, the ship had five thrusters that could each be rotated. A dynamic positioning system kept the ship locked in place by constantly adjusting these, so there was no need for an anchor. The job was routine. Duncan told Chris as he secured the heavy helmet for his partner. 
He felt relaxed, focused, and ready to go. Dropping through the two and a half foot hole at the bottom of the bell and into the dark, the marine life caught in the light of Chris's helmet lamp was beautiful. He and David started work within the manifold, a structure 30 feet high and 66 feet long. Its pipes and valves managed oil flowing from wells to platforms. On the ship, dive supervisor Craig Frederick sat before the controls and monitors showing the feeds from the diver's helmet cameras. He followed their progress, giving instructions by intercom for each stage of the job. Meanwhile, in the cramped bell, Duncan sat surrounded by gauges. He monitored his colleagues' oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, but had no communication with them. Chris had been working for about an hour when he heard a noise from Craig's control room. It was an alarm. In fact, the Topaz had a major problem. The green light on Craig's instrument panel was suddenly glowing amber, and then red. The positioning system had failed. The boat was now drifting and would soon drag the divers with it. The red light indicated that they had lost control of the vessel and its navigation systems. Craig ordered the team to leave their tools and get back to the well. It was a highly unusual request and Chris and David started climbing hand over hand up their umbilicals towards the top of the structure. In the bell, Duncan didn't know what was happening, but followed Craig's instruction to start hauling in the cords. Glancing up, Chris had expected to see the bell's lights, but there was only blackness. Then he felt his umbilical tugging as he reached the top of the manifold and saw that it had been looped around a metal outcrop. He struggled to unhitch it, but the knot only pulled tighter. In the bell, Duncan saw that Chris's line was suddenly dangerously tight. Craig ordered to give Chris more slack. Duncan replied saying he couldn't. Not only was it too tight, but the cord was also pulling its anchor off the wall, with steel struts bending and bolts groaning. If the cord broke off, it would leave Chris adrift and without oxygen. As Chris struggled to free himself, David tried to get back to help flailing his arms against the water. He almost made it. The two divers' hands were just a couple of yards apart when David's cord yanked him away. Chris saw a look of sorrow on David's face as he disappeared into the dark. Chris doubled his frantic attempts to dislodge the cord. He heard it creak, and then the air supply line broke, followed by the communications feed. Unable to inhale, Chris instinctively opened the emergency air tank on his back. Seconds later, there was a horrific noise as the cable snapped. His lifeline had severed completely. Chris was thrown backwards, sinking slowly, his helmet silent without the intercom, his lights dead, his suit beginning to cool. He knew he had about eight minutes of oxygen. In the bell, Duncan pulled up the slack umbilical, hoping Chris would be at the end of it. His heart sank as the broken hot water hose came up. Landing on the soft seabed, Chris struggled to his feet in total darkness. The ship could track him via a beacon on his suit, but he knew that if he could somehow get himself to the top of the manifold, there was a better chance of rescue before his oxygen ran out. Yet he had no idea where it was. There was a real risk that he could walk the complete wrong way into the blackness. He picked a direction seemingly at random and took cautious steps, feeling only the mud beneath his feet. Suddenly, his outstretched hands struck metal. He grasped it in relief and then began struggling up the structure, breathing hard. Reaching the top, he still couldn't see the bell. He crawled onto the platform and clung to the metal grill, terrified that the current would drag him away. 
he reckoned he had about five minutes of air left. Yet the situation was even worse than he realised. The ship was now 700 feet away. The crew were desperately trying to steer back, but without the positioning system, it took two people to manually coordinate the thrusters. The topaz was slowly zigzagging against the waves. As the minutes passed, Chris's fear set in. He shouted out for Duncan in the darkness. His chest grew tighter as his oxygen dwindled. He felt himself slowly slipping into unconsciousness. Craig had ordered the Topaz's remotely operated underwater vehicle to go down and look for Chris. It sent back pictures of him lying on the metal grill. His hands seemed to be twitching. He wondered whether Chris was still alive or whether his limbs were just moving in the current. It was 16 minutes since the umbilical had snapped. By now, David made it back to the bell, desperate to retrieve Chris if they could get back in position. Craig kept him and Duncan updated on the boat's progress. Attempts by the Topaz's engineers to re-engage the positioning system had been in vain, so in desperation they shut it down and restarted it. Amazingly, this actually worked. At this point, more than 25 minutes had passed since Chris's umbilical snapped. Finally, with the ship over the dive site, David dropped down and found Chris on his back. He glanced through Chris's mask. There was water inside. He clipped Chris onto a rescue lanyard and began hauling them both up his umbilical cord. By the time he was able to push Chris's upper body into the bell, another six minutes had passed. At this stage, Chris had been underwater for roughly 23 minutes without oxygen. Duncan unclipped Chris's helmet. His eyes were closed. His bald head was blue. Duncan knew there was little chance of surviving that long without oxygen. But with nothing to lose, he administered CPR. He gave Chris two breaths, and unbelievably, Chris suddenly inhaled. His eyes opened and he blinked. For Craig, watching via monitor, it was a huge moment. Chris then gave him a weak thumbs up. Duncan probed him with questions after flushing his suit with hot water to warm him up. Chris was groggy but remarkably seemed himself. Back in the ship's sat chamber, he got medical attention. Once Chris was stable, they visited him. There were many hugs. The team were also thankful that they weren't going to have to spend four days in a decompression chamber with a dead body. Over the next three days, as the men depressurized on the topaz, now Dr. Aberdeen, they talked through what had happened over and over. How Chris survived and without brain damage remains unclear. The oxygen in divers gas is about four times richer than normal air, so his body may have been saturated with enough to keep him going. Hypothermia could have put him in shutdown mode too sending oxygen to his organs. Three weeks later, once Chris was declared fit, he returned to the North Sea with David and Duncan to finish the job. I didn't want to lose my nerve, says Chris, who is still a sat diver. The following April, Chris and his fiance got married in an emotional ceremony near their home. Chris has since had a documentary made about his horrifying ordeal called Last Breath. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider subscribing to the channel and stay safe out there.